Hey, hey, hey. Welcome to the Formation Forum. It is Friday. Good morning. Pastor B, Brian R. Green, or B, depending on, you know, your relationship with me, right? How's everybody doing? I trust everybody is doing well. Um, of course, you are in uh, uh, the forum where we take what? Leadership and personal development principles, right? We marry them to the many aspects of everyday life uh, through the lens of the Bible. Why? So we can foster a biblical, biblical worldview, right? So listen, you are with me for the next 3,600 ticks on your watch. You are with me for one hour. Uh, I am so delighted again to be here, be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. I am rejoicing in the glory of our Father. Um, since you're watching us on Facebook Live, I need you to do me a favor. You know the deal. Go ahead and like this page. And I want you to share the broadcast. Share from where you are because it allows me, allows us here at WBGR to know where you're watching from know where you're watching from. That's always a, a great thing. Just take a few seconds, click that like button, click the share button, and, and we can uh, get and jump right into it. Now, last week, of course, if you joined us uh, live or were able to see the recorded um, video on demand, then you know that we dealt with who you are becoming. If you were able to see it here on the network, WBGR Network, or maybe you caught it on our uh, channel at thechristnation.com, uh, you'll recall again, we were talking about who you are becoming. We asked that question, who you are becoming. Now, normally at this point right here, we, are gonna, we would jump right into our discussion topic. However... Uh, there have been a number of things that have happened over the last, let's say, eight to, eight to ten days, right? Uh, so we don't want to be silent on things. We, you know, this is the formation form, and so we want to make sure we're looking at things in life also. Now, we do have a discussion topic, but we want to let and allow some of the things that are happening to kind of bleed into, direct us into, set the stage for, if you will, uh, what we'll talk about. So what I'd like to do is just give a few minutes, because we can't talk about everything. We can't talk about Comey. Um, you know, there's enough people talking about our president. There's enough things going on um, uh, outside of the po political realm. There's, there's lots of stuff going on, but we want to take a few minutes just to talk about or begin to consider the things and the events that happened at Starbucks in Philadelphia. Yes, Starbucks in Philadelphia. Now, we know that there are a number of reports, there are a number of opinions um, that are circulating in cybersphere. Uh, we understand that, and it's, it's okay. So, so we're not going to necessarily give a bunch of opinions. We're not going to deal with all of those things. Um, but but there's a few things that kind of as I was reading through and looking um, through, looking on the net looking at different uh, articles something that kind of struck me was is interesting I did read one comment one comment said that this is this was modern day racism and and I, it, it's I guess for me the adjective right modern day the, this 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 lead into racism it's it's the adjective that always gets me because it suggests that there was at some point in history where racism didn't exist. Like we, we had racism, then it stopped, and now this is modern day. Well, you know, let's be honest. It, it's not really modern day racism. It's the same racism. Now, when I say that, I want to be clear because, you know, we are, we're people, we're humans, and, and you don't know the things that happen in folks' life. You don't know their upbringing. You don't know the, the things that, that have uh, created the mindsets of people. And so you want to be careful. And this is, this is my opinion. This is something that I would say. You want to be careful about labeling somebody a racist B 
because they did something obviously that was racially motivated, right? It's, it, there's no question of whether or not this was racial profile. There's, there's just, and if, you know, I, I did see another comment that suggested that this was just some media ploy, right? To, to create this, 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 uh, this argument or this ratings uh, agenda. Mm, I mean, I just, I just think that's a bit detached, right? Like you can't really sit there and say that this is some type of an agenda. Uh, it's something that's really happening and we, we need to address it, right? So um, it, it, I understand there's different opinions, there's different things went on. So I did get a chance to see at least a little bit of the um, Howard Schultz interview with Gail King on CBS, I, guess, I think it was Good Morning America. Uh, and he said some things. He said that this was unconscious bias. And he, he used that term uh, a couple of times, unconscious bias. And, and I don't know that it's unconscious. And, and it may be because, you know, folks are, 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 are grow up in a particular environment with a particular set of beliefs and values and things. And, and sometimes that can... Well, not sometimes. It will create prejudices and biases. I don't care who you are. Everybody has a prejudice and a bias from a very general, uh, uh, from a very general statement as a very general statement. But that doesn't mean um, that every bias is conscious. Now, I absolutely, I, I'm actually not saying that this was not an unconscious bias. But I, I, I do think that the person that the that the young lady um, consciously made a decision. Right, that that she consciously made a decision to call the police and and so on and so forth. I I, I thought it was interesting that that Howard Schultz also said that um, nobody should be asked to leave because one of the things that that folks will say is well, but they weren't buying anything. Now I've been to Starbucks. I've been to Starbucks lots and lots of times. Sometimes just to use the restroom. Can you believe that now? Now, I know I've been into some places, into some, some neighborhoods where there's, there's different restaurants where the, they literally, like, it's locked. Um, and, and there's reasons for that, right? And I understand that. But um, this is Starbucks, man. Not like So the, the whole argument about the policy and so on and so forth, that, that's just a, it's a dead argument. You know, many of us have just gone into a Starbucks and, and used a restroom or, or sat there waiting for someone else. You know, um, nobody should be asked to leave, he said in that, that interview. And, and, I, and it was interesting how he viewed Starbucks. He said, Starbucks is the third place between work and home. Man, what an, what, what an interesting thought process because, yes, I go to Starbucks grab a cup of coffee, that $15 cup of coffee. <laughs> but, but the reality is that it is a place where you can just kind of go, I'm in between where I'm going next, may stop at a, a Starbucks or a, or Panera Bread or, or, or someplace else, um, someplace that, that, that has this cafe feel to it. Um, now, the call that went out, if you, if, you, if you actually listen to the call, when the young lady called, she said that she had two gentlemen that were refusing to purchase or to leave. And somehow the communication went out to the police. Maybe it was a, a second or third communication. I'm not, I'm not sure on that. But there was a communication that said we have a group of men causing a disturbance. There is a disturbance at Starbucks. We have a group of men um, causing a disturbance. This is something that's just, just, just that you need to think about. The mindset of the police officers move going into something where they're being told that there is a disturbance. You know, I want to be fair. Uh, yeah, I think that, that we that there may be procedures and policies that need to be addressed from the police. OK, I get that. Um, but I want to be clear, because if a if a police officer get takes a call and says that there is a domestic violence or domestic dispute that's going on. And, and it is suggested to them that, that there is some violence involved or, or some type of disturbance. Technically, they, they're, they're not supposed to go in there and try to figure it out. What they're trying to do is they're trying to de-escalate 
the 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 situation. So someone has to leave, right? And that's just something about the police. That's not about should they should how it played out. That's not a comment on that. You know, I'm not commenting on that right now. Um, but I do want to make this statement that 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 black males, you know, boys uh, and, and and men, uh, we pass through environments that are structured to hate, right? They're structured to hate. So you're sitting in a situation like this, you don't know what to do. I know uh, when if if a police officer, if I see a police car even come behind me, I am nervous because you don't know, you know, you don't know, and it's unfortunate. And there's some folks, there's some groups of people, you'll never understand this because you've never been targeted constantly by the police. So uh, black males that, that we pass through these environments from the time we're little that are structured to hate us, environments that are structured to minimalize our humanity and our dignity. And that's not new. That's not new. It is an issue. It is an issue. And listen, I know, again, there, there'll be all types of opinions about this. What's the proper response or, or, or what should have been done and, 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 and so on and so forth. Should she still have her job? Because, you know, doing something like this and, and, and then going to training is kind of like being on paid leave. Oh, okay. It, it's, a, it's a little bit like that, right? Just a little bit, at least from one person's perspective. Now, she might have a family. I'm not, I'm not saying this without compassion. What I'm saying is that there are always consequences to the things that you do, right? There is, of course, um, this, this question in, in this continued call, right? We have a continued call, and this is going to really push us into our, our discussion. Um, the, the first question is, I looked through the net, I was looking, well, what's the church's responses? And I'm looking for some, I'm looking for some named people. I'm looking for some named people, some big name people that have the platform, where's your response? Where's your response? Because because you got the platform already. Everybody's already listening to you. Where you at? Where, where's your response in all this? Right? So, so the question always is, what should the church or how should the church respond to this? And this question um, is always a question that's based, that positions church in, as an institution. And, and the church is an institution. So I'm not saying that, it, that it's not. Uh, the church is an institution. But the question is, what should the church do? Now, there's this call for racial reconciliation, right? I know one, one pastor I read about, I think his name is uh, Dean Nelson out in Philly. Um, he, he's putting together some things. But, but this is, it's always an interesting thing. And, and I'm a word person. I, you know, I like to write. I like to talk. Um, reconciliation suggests that there was harmony at some point. And so I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, pour gas on it. I'm just asking like reconciliation suggests that there was harmony. Reconciliation begins though with repentance, right? Somebody, somebody got to repent and, and typically it's the offender, not the offended, but reconciliation can begin by either. We know that because Christ went to the cross and he certainly was the offended. Um, uh, uh, but when I ask the question, how should the church respond? I'm not speaking from an institution uh, as an institution known as a church. I am more speaking as we do in Christ's nation. In Christ's nation, uh, we believe that we don't do church. We are the church. And so when I say, how should the church respond? I'm speaking about the body. I'm speaking about the body. The answer is simple. It's not easy. And it can't be explained away by some bumper sticker, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And, and we'll get into that. But as we move into this to this next section, because I know we're 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 at near, at the end of this first uh, segment, where we're going in this discussion is is, is with the church and, and this formation of the church is this: when you're in a culture like we are and you begin to build things, we're a culture that builds. The question is, what should the church do? But the question of that depends on the Jesus that you serve. Because we're a culture that builds things, we even build Jesus's. So today we're going to talk about when we get back, we're going to we're going to begin to talk about the cultural Jesus. So when we get back, right after this break, on the other side of this break, we'll begin to talk about the cultural Jesus. So stay tuned, stay with me, and when we get back, we'll begin our discussion from that point. I'll see you when you get back. Hey, welcome back, welcome back. 
You are in the formation form where we take principles of leadership and personal development and marry them to the many aspects of everyday life through the lens of truth in order to foster a biblical worldview. Uh, if you're just joining us, welcome. Uh, again, so glad you're here in the forum. Um, before we jump back into our discussion, please, if you have not already, go ahead and like this page and then uh, also share. Share the broadcast so that we can see where you are, uh, where you are, are watching us from. Uh, so that we can begin to interact within the show as well as outside of the show as uh, as well. Uh, again, click the, click the like button and the share button um, from there. We are just at the tail end of, we were discussing the events that happened in Philadelphia <clears throat> at the Starbucks, and we were moving into this discussion of what the church should do, and of course, uh, I am a uh, believer that the church is not simply the institution that, that folks go to. Uh, people do church, and, and if you've been anywhere around me, uh, connected to us on Christ Nation at thechristnation.com, um, but into this ministry, the Christ Nation, um, as well as when I'm down as, as pastor and senior pastor of Emmanuel City Church, uh, we don't do church. I, I am, we, we are teaching this, we are living this, why? because that's part of the issue. Folks are just doing church every Sunday, Wednesday, uh, choir rehearsal, you know, this meeting and that meeting, this committee and that committee. Nothing's wrong necessarily with uh, um, uh, the fact that, that, we're, that we're doing those things at church. But what I am saying is that when your activity is mostly doing church, uh, then you release yourself of the responsibility of being the church. And so we are uh, using this and taking this incident that happened in Philadelphia, and we begin to start a discussion on the cultural Jesus. Now, let me be real clear. Um, because of those events, because we wanted to deal with the events in, in, in Philadelphia and kind of uh, place them as a foundation for our discussion on the cultural Jesus, we're not going to finish this cultural Jesus uh, discussion today. So let's just dub this the cultural Jesus Part one, all right? Um, we talked about the church. We talked about us being the church. We, we, I said that it can't be, our response can't be something like, what would Jesus do? Um, and, and we'll get into why that's, that's problematic later. Um, but well, we look to scriptures. <clears throat> However, somehow uh, the scriptures don't seem to read the same way for everybody, right? Uh, why, why is that? Why, why is it that the scriptures don't read the same way to everybody? And again, it's because today we're a culture of monuments. Think about that, right? We're a culture of monuments. We're always building stuff. We we, we build statues. Uh, uh, well, well, let's say it this way. Well, what's a monument? A, a statue, a building, uh, some type of structure that's erected to commemorate someone famous or, or some notable person or event, right? That's what a, a monument is. So we build things, we, we build houses, we build cars, we build commercial buildings, we build neighborhoods, we build businesses, uh, we, we build business plans. Uh, in the church, we build Jesuses, right? We build Jesuses. Uh, you know, the event in, in Philadelphia provides a great place here for us to look at how we build Jesuses, you know? But it also provides us an opportunity to ask which Jesus do I serve? And so that's something personal. That's something personal, right? Um, um, think about this. Think of it from this perspective. Any description of Jesus that attempts to explain who Jesus is is subject to Jesus as revealed in the Bible. I'm going to say that again, that any description of Jesus that attempts to explain who Jesus is, is subject to the Jesus as revealed in the Bible. And I am saying the Jesus, not because Jesus isn't it, but I'm speaking from the perspective of constructing, whether it be your theology, whether it be your, 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 your worldview, but if you're going to explain Jesus, you can't explain him 
outside of what's revealed in the scriptures, right? Other than just, you know, you believe that he was a historical figure, which some people don't, they don't hold to that either. Um, I'm not even going to address that. Um, but, but why do I say that? Because, because Jesus says some very specific things, but there are things that are said about Jesus that are uh, very specific that create and give to us who Jesus is and the Jesus that we ought to follow. But we, being builders, we build towers like Babel. So we also build Jesus's, these constructs of, of Jesus that typically are molded by the culture, right? So Jesus says something like this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through, through, through me. What's that mean? So, so either he said it and meant it or, or he didn't say it at all, right? Um, uh, uh, there is, th there's this also, a Acts 4.12, uh, that says that there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other, uh, no other name under heaven given to man, given to people, um, and we must be saved by it, right? So there's no other name under heaven that, that for which man must be saved, depending on the translation of the scriptures that you're reading. Since, since we're in a culture that is largely run on public opinion, we find ourselves in a loop, a, a cycle of satisfying the public. And because we're in this cycle of satisfying the public, what happens, folks, right? What happens is that if you're, if you're in this thing about satisfying people, then you're going to construct Jesus. You're going to, you're going to shape Jesus so that he's acceptable to people. Well, that's interesting, right? I mean, at what point does Jesus become um, subject to what we accept? Subject to man, in other words. At what, at what point, at what point does that happen? Now, now understand something. In industry, it's fine to listen to public opinion. It's fine to say, okay, well, we, we sell sandwiches. And so we put out this particular sandwich and, and, and no one's buying it. No one's purchasing the sandwich. Well, public opinion, in a very general sense, public opinion is that the sandwich is no good, or, or at least it doesn't work in this market. But in another market, it works. I give you an example. There's this there's a sandwich called a McRib and, and it used to be around here. It's still out there. It's just not in this market like it is in other markets. All right? It's seasonal in some markets, in other markets it's not. So unfortunately, what the institutionalized church has done sometimes, and this is not a call to every single church because I know how people do. Not at my church. My church is this. My church, yeah, my church, which is an indication that you might be in a construct because the reality of the fact is it's just the church. It's just the church. And this is, this, these are the things, this is how we live. We live out the gospel. We, in Christ nation, we liberate the gospel, right? We do not liberate it from orthodoxy liberated from the institution so that who controls the gospel of Christ is the scripture. Now that doesn't put away from teaching and there is good teaching and there is bad teaching. Don't so please don't, don't travel down that road. Um, theologians, cause I know y'all are out there. I know, I know, I know y'all are out there and, and you, and you're, you know, you're trying to find a reason. That's not what I'm saying though. Um, what I am saying is that we have constructed Jesus's, right? That's just what we do. Okay, so now watch. What's the implication of this statement that, I, that, that we made? That any description of Jesus that attempts to explain who Jesus is, is subject to the Jesus as revealed in the Bible. Here's an, here's an implication. If this statement is true, all right, then one would be subject to the entirety of biblical record. 
if, if the statement that, that I'm making today is true, then, then we're subject to the entirety of the biblical record. One would be subject to Jesus in the Bible, not some culturally evolved mosaic presented for our subjective approval. Yes, yes. See, see, if the statement is true, then it is we who are subject to scripture. Not scripture, which is subject to us. This is where you get into those arguments of interpretation. We're not dealing with that today. But we are going to deal with the cultural Jesus. You know, I, I, I remember um, um, watching, or, or not just watching, but being in households when I was younger. And I remember when there's pictures of Jesus and, and it, it, we went through this phase, this thing where, well, why is the pictures of Jesus white? I mean, come on. Like, this is like, like, you don't have to do a lot of historical digging to figure out um, ethnicity. But this is the other point of that. When the argument of Christ starts with race, Jesus becomes a Western construct. Oh, okay. Yeah. See, once, once the gospel begins with race, whether Jesus is white, black, Asian, uh, Puerto Rican, once you do that, then it automatically becomes a Western construct. Why? Because race is an issue that we deal with in the West. First, I'm not saying that they don't deal with any race stuff. I'm saying it's not like it is here. There are other issues and there are other ways that we separate and push people down, whether it be classism or, or, or any other things like that. Um, but, but consider this, and this is why we talk about being subject to the entire biblical record, because Jesus... When he's walking on the road to Emos, Luke 24, he's talking to these to these guys, and they're going someplace, and he he he's and the scripture says that beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself, what? And all the scriptures. There was no New Testament, so the gospel isn't only New Testament. The gospel has always been around, it's always been pointing to him, but the gospel is is seen primarily in the New Testament. But this is what I mean by that. The grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God is not only a New Testament thing. That's 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 my point there. Uh, um, um, so understand this. We are not called to serve a created Christ, but a risen Christ. We're not called to serve a created Christ, but a risen Christ. Now, we're near the end of this segment. This hour is going very quickly. So on the other side of this break, right, we're going to continue in this discussion I want you to think about this last statement. We are not called to serve a created Christ, but the risen Christ, the risen Jesus. So uh, we're going to take a break here. When we get back, we'll jump right back into our discussion on the cultural Jesus. Thank you for joining us. Hit the like button, hit the share button. We will see you on the other side of this break. See you when we get back.